Hey, this is a Q&A session. I was asked the question to explain the parable of the ten virgins. So that's what we're going to go over in this Q&A. Um, go over to Matthew 13 to start because I want you to see since it is a parable most all of Christianity will tell you that a parable is a story that Jesus told to make some deep spiritual truth easier to understand. But that's actually the opposite. We see from God's, Jesus tells you why. And it's so, it's harder to understand. He tells his first parable in Matthew 13, starting in verse 3. And then when he's done, look in verse 9. Matthew 13, 9, he says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you're not a believer, you're not going to understand the parable. And if you give, if you know, if I give an explanation of it, and you don't believe God's word, you're going to say, oh, that's crazy, that's not what it means, that's not what it is. You have to have the spiritual ears to hear. Verse 10, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, meaning the believers, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, meaning unbelievers, it is not given. And so that's what a parable is. So now, go to Matthew 25, and this is the parable of the ten virgins. So this, what Jesus is doing then, is he is taking some truth about the mysteries of the kingdom, because the parables that Jesus tells always relate to the kingdom of heaven, which is God's eternal earthly kingdom, where Israel will rule and reign with him for all eternity with the Gentiles under them. And so this is relating to the kingdom of heaven, and he's going to put it basically in code so that only those with the Holy Spirit have the ears to hear. Those who want to believe, who have the Holy Spirit, who have trusted in the blood of Christ as atonement for your salvation, at least today, that's what it would be. You have eternal life, and then you have the Holy Spirit, and you choose to believe your Bible. Those are the only people who are going to understand this. Everybody else who denies the Bible is true, or they're not believers, are going to say this explanation is crazy. So, you have to want to believe Scripture, and you have to be saved in order to understand this. Okay, so Matthew 25, verse 1 through verse 13 is the parable of the ten virgins. Verse 1 says, Then... Okay, so that right there links this parable to what Jesus has already said in the previous chapter. Because he says, then. So in other words, based on the information we've learned in Matthew 24, this is going to help you explain what's going on. So the parable in Matthew 24, if you go back in Matthew 24 to verse 3, the whole chapter is an answer, Jesus' answer to this question. Matthew 24, 3 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, that's Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And the explanation given for the rest of chapter 24 is the explanation of the events in the tribulation period. Uh, you know, down in verse 6 and 7, he talks about some things. He says in verse 8, these are the beginning of sorrow. So, through verse 8, he's talking about the first half of the tribulation period. Then verse 9 and following, he's talking about the last half of the tribulation period. Then you get down to verse 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. So, he goes through the entire tribulation period. And then he talks about immediately after... And then he says, after tribulation period, verse 30, he says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So then he's coming there, verse 31, He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They gather the elect. And now he's starting to explain, um, he uses some, he has a parable of the fig tree there. He talks about, um, Verse 34, the generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In other words, um, the unbelievers, the apostate nation of Israel, will continue 
to be a large influence, to be ruling over Israel. The believers will continue to be a little flock all the way through the end of the tribulation period until Jesus' second coming. Verse 38, he says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So there he's mentioning that you've got some events to look for in Matthew 24 about the tribulation period, but specifically when, so you can get an idea of when Jesus is coming, but specifically when the day and the hour no man knows. And so the and so then the conclusion, verse 42, Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And so they are to watch for the signs. Now go down to chapter 25, verse 13. This is the conclusion of the parable of the ten virgins. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So he's talked about the tribulation period in chapter 24. Then in chapter 25, he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. And so what he's doing here is he's giving them signs in Matthew 24. And in verse 42, he tells them to watch for the Son of Man's coming based on the signs that they see, based on what Jesus has said in Matthew 24. And now the parable of the ten virgins, the conclusion is the same. Watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And so we know already, without having read the parable, we know that the parable of the ten virgins is a parable to teach the little flock. They, they need to be watching for the signs. And the reason, as we're going to see, the reason is because they are the only ones, only the believers, that little flock, the believing remnant of Israel, they're the only ones who are going to recognize when Jesus is going to come back. And they are the only ones who are going to give the warning to the entire nation of Israel, the Lord's coming, you better get ready. And so, if it wasn't for the little flock, the, the many or most of the people who uh, in Israel, most of the people who are saved in Israel at Jesus' second coming, if it wasn't for the little flock watching, they would not be saved. They would not be ready. That's the point of the parable. So let's go through the parable. Let's read it, and then we'll go over the details of what everything means. So Matthew 25, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven, so that's referring to God's earthly kingdom, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, the kingdom of heaven there um, on the earth, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So now, let's go through the detail to figure out what it's talking about. So, uh, first we recognize from verse 1 that this is talking about the tribulation period and Jesus' second coming. And it's talking about the people who will make it into the kingdom of heaven. There are ten virgins, it says... It says that they took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Look over at Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when we're told that the ten virgins took their lamps... 
What it means is they took the word of God. Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet. So the lamp there would be the word of God. And they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are described as being wise and five are foolish. They're in verse 2. We're going to get into that a little later what that means. Verse 3 says, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Oil in the Bible is a type of the Holy Spirit. The reason they anointed with oil, uh, you know, over in Psalm 23. In fact, look over in Psalm 23. Famous psalm about the Lord being my shepherd. It's actually a reference to the tribulation period. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So if he's the shepherd, the good shepherd, the way he's the good shepherd is he dies on the cross for their sins. And as a result, then he leads them into the kingdom. And that's what verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4 talks about the tribulation period. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He's with them through his word. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They're corrected by the rod and the staff as the trials of the tribulation period. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's preparing the marriage supper of the Lamb for them. But yet apostate Israel is still around in the tribulation period. Now notice what it says. It says, Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Anointing the head with oil there is a type of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it, he, there's a reference there about he says, he, if, if I look, look over there in Acts chapter 2. Look specifically at what it says. People really don't think about this. But in Acts chapter 2, let's uh, look in uh, verse 17. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. When the Holy Ghost was promised, the, prophet, the prophecy in the book of Joel said that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Well, if you anoint your head with oil, the way you do it is you pour the oil on the head. And the reason it says, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, is because oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. So if I'm anointing someone's head with oil, as in Psalm 23, then that's a type of the Holy Spirit being poured out. So now, back in Matthew 25, when we're told in verse 3, that the foolish took no oil with them. And then verse 4 says, The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. What this means is that the foolish, although they had God's word to them, because the little flock had preached it, so they had God's word, and they apparently believed God's word, and we'll get into that in a minute, they stopped believing. And because they stopped believing, the Holy Spirit was taken away from them. So they may have God's word, they initially believed the gospel, but then they did so they fell away is going to be the term, and we'll look at that next. And so when it was time to meet the bridegroom at Jesus' second coming, they were no longer believers because they don't have oil with them, they don't have the Holy Spirit, whereas the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, so they still have the Holy Spirit, which means they believe the gospel of the kingdom. Look over in Luke chapter 8. We're going to look in Luke 8, and then we're going to look in Hebrews 6. In Luke 8, there is another parable. This is actually the parable that Jesus gives in Matthew 13. Um, and he's explaining the parable, the parable of the sower. And he explains it here, starting in verse 11. 
he says in verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Now remember, we had the word of God in Matthew 25. All ten virgins took lamps with them, so they all had the word of God. In this parable, the seed is the word of God. In the parable, which is given in verses, uh, let's see, 5, Luke 8, 5, down to verse 8, there's the seed that goes on to different types of ground. And look in verse 13 now. There is some seed that falls upon a rock. And now Jesus explains what that means. He says in Luke 8, 13, that they on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. So they hear the word of God. The seed comes upon them, which is the word of God. They hear the word of God. That would be, in this case, the gospel of the kingdom. They receive it with joy. Then it says, and these have no root, which for a while believe. So they believe the gospel of the kingdom for a while. They believe it. You know, they're taught, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And they say, hey, that's great. I want in on that. So they believe. But then it says, and in time of temptation fall away. In time of temptation, they fall away. Well, what's the time of temptation? The temptation is they're threatened with losing their life because of the image of the beast that is set up in the temple halfway through the tribulation period. Um, so it says in time of temptation, fall away. The term fall away, those two words, fall away, is only found in two verses in the Bible. It's here in Luke 8, 13, and it's also in Hebrews 6. So let's look in Hebrews 6, and it's going to tell you about the falling away, and it's going to link it to the Holy Spirit as well. So keep in mind that those who are on the rock or the stony believers are those who they actually believe at first, because it says for a while they believe. So they get the Word of God, they have the lamp, they believe it, but when temptation comes, they fall away. Now, Hebrews 6, verse 4, talks about what happens to these people. Hebrews 6, verse 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So they have been enlightened, meaning they have believed the gospel, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, the gift of eternal life, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. There's the Holy Ghost there. So they were anointed with oil, you could say, type of that. They believed uh, the gospel. They were water baptized. They received the Holy Ghost. And then verse 5, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So they believed the gospel. They've seen healing of the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils. So that's those powers of the world to come. Verse 4 said, it is impossible for those. Verse 6 says, if they shall fall away. There's your term, fall away, found in Luke 8, 13. Remember it says, in time of temptation they fall away. Here it says, it is impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So these verses here say, it says, here are some people who heard the gospel of the kingdom. They believed it. They were water baptized. They received the Holy Ghost. And then they fell away. And because they fell away, it says in verse 6, verse six it, is, if they should, it is impossible for them to renew them again unto repentance. Repentance is the first part of the gospel for them. Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized. Repent means change your mind. So before you were trusting in your own self-righteousness, religion, your good works, whatever it was, and then you change your mind, you believe the gospel of the kingdom, you're water baptized, you receive the Holy Ghost, now you're part of the little flock, but according to this verse, if you fall away, you can't be renewed again unto repentance. So if you go to try to get saved all over again because you've fallen away, in time of temptation, you fell away, according to Luke 8, 13. It is impossible for you to say, well, I'm changing my mind again. I see Jesus is coming back, so I'm going to believe the gospel again, be water baptized. 
this verse here says it's impossible to renew them again because they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. The Son of God has already been crucified for their sins once. And now they would have to be crucified a second time in order for them to be saved. Why would he have to be crucified a second time? This sin, that, or this falling away, is a reference to a specific sin. And that is worshiping the image of the beast or taking the mark of the beast. Go over to Revelation 13. And so when Luke 8 says, if they shall, fall, they shall fall away in time of temptation, this is the temptation that it's talking about. In Revelation 13, 15, it says that the false prophet, it said, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the temptation is, God says, don't deny me, be true to me, and the temptation is, well, I've got a strong temptation to deny God by bowing down to the image of the beast, because if I don't do it, I'm going to be killed. And then the second temptation is the mark of the beast, verse 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So the temptation to, there's a strong temptation to worship the image of the beast because if I don't do it, I could be killed. Then there's also a strong temptation to take the mark of the beast because if I don't take the mark, I can't buy or sell. I can't get food. I can't, the house that I owned is lost because all my economic resources are taken away from me because I don't have the mark. So those are the temptations. And you may ask, well, how do you know that's what Hebrews 6 and Luke 8 are referring to. Well, the reason I know that is because Revelation 14 verse 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So according to these verses, whoever takes the mark of the beast or worships the image of the beast, they are going to burn forever in an eternal lake of fire. There is no provision here about regaining your salvation. So there's a promise of God that you'll have eternal damnation in the lake of fire if you take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast. Hebrews 6 4, uh, verse 6 says, If they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again in repentance. So in this case, Revelation 14, 9 through 11, we learn that it is impossible to renew these people again to repentance because God promises they have eternal damnation in the lake of fire if they take the mark of the beast or worship the image. It doesn't have any provision for forgiveness here. So since there's no provision for forgiveness in Hebrews 6.6 6, and there's no provision of forgiveness in Revelation 14.9-11, we can conclude that the sin that's talked about in Hebrews 6.4-6 6, is the sin of worshiping the beast or taking the mark of the beast. That's then a definition of what falling away means. And then we saw in Luke 8 that the stony ground believers, they fall away in time of temptation, and this would be the temptation. Uh, to see another uh, idea of this stated by the Lord Jesus Christ, look over in Matthew 10. In Matthew 10, he says this, now, he doesn't get the, the, the specifics are not found until you get to Revelation 14 because of progressive revelation, the detail isn't given late, until later. But he does mention in Matthew 10 uh, this possibility. He says there in verse 32, Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, 
him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So there's a promise by God that he's going to deny people of their position in heavenly places there, not heavenly places, in the uh, kingdom of heaven, um, because he's going to deny them before his Father. So he denies them the, um, and it's not just their position, it says he shall, but him will I also deny. So he is denied a place in the kingdom. He is not going to be part of the kingdom of heaven if he denies Jesus Christ before men. And that's exactly what worshiping the image of the beast or taking the mark of the beast is all about. Just like in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told, or Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, their Hebrew names, they were told to bow down before the image of the beast, not the image of the beast, the image of, of Nebuchadnezzar, and if they didn't bow down, they'd be thrown into a fiery furnace. Uh, capital punishment right there. Um, God saved them, but normally if you're thrown into a fiery furnace, you would die. So, capital punishment for not bowing down. What Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah did was they refused to bow down. And so by not bowing down, they confessed God before Nebuchadnezzar. They said, we are not going to align ourselves with the God of the Babylonians because our God is Jehovah God, the God of Israel. If they had bowed down, then they would have denied Jehovah God. And they did it before men. This was a very public thing. And that's what's going to happen with the image of the beast. Bow down, declare that the Antichrist is God. If you declare the Antichrist is God, you're denying Jesus Christ is God. And those who do that then are denying him. Jesus says, I will deny that person before my Father. So they're denied a place in the kingdom. Revelation 14 says, if you do those things, you're going to go to the lake of fire. Hebrews 6 says, if you fall away, you can't be renewed again unto repentance. And so the situation then is basically this is the, although the term is never found in Scripture, you could call this the unpardonable sin. There is no forgiveness for taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the image of the beast. And that's what these foolish people have done. And the reason they do that, look in Psalm 14, because Psalm 14 is going to give you a definition. Remember, the ten virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. The foolish ones have no oil. And Psalm 14 gives you a definition of what a fool is. Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the biblical definition of a fool is someone who says there is no God. And... God says in His Word in Revelation 14, if you take the mark or worship the image of the beast, you have your place in the lake of fire, eternal damnation in the lake of fire. And so if anyone bows down to the image of the beast or takes the mark of the beast, knowing this, then they would, then by definition, and by the way, that angel... You don't really have to read Revelation 14 because the third angel is going to proclaim in a loud voice to all the world. So even if they have not read Revelation 14, they still have heard the word from heaven through an angel that came to them uh, and told the whole world that if you take the mark or worship the image, you're going to go to hell. But if you don't believe there is a God, then you will go ahead and do that to save your own skin. But if you do believe there is a God, you won't do it. Because you'll say, that message by that angel is true. I'm not going to bow down or, or uh, take the mark of the beast. So, the fool is someone who believes there is no God. Which means they are going to ignore the message of eternal damnation in the lake of fire for, not, for, for bowing down or taking the marks. So and now, go back to Matthew 25. So in verse 3, when it says the foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, what it means is that they had the word of God, they believed the gospel of the kingdom, then in temptation they fall away, which we've already seen means that they are told to worship the image of the beast or lose their life, take the mark of the beast 
or not have any food, and they decide to trust man's word over God because they are foolish, and they have changed their, mi changed their minds and said, there is no God. I'm not going to believe that gospel of the kingdom anymore because there is no God. The only thing that it, there is is right here. And so to save my own life, I'm going to bow down or worship the image. And that angel that said, if I do that... Uh,